pastor is away. Apparently you didn't hear that because you came anyway. And uh, we're, glad, we're glad all of you are here. Um, we want to begin with a word of prayer and invite God's presence to be with us and help us through this uh, week and help us in this Bible study that we will hear God's word and God will speak to us through his word. God is a good God, amen? amen. And he delights in our coming to him. He invites us to come to him. And his ear is always open to our cry. And nothing is too small or insignificant for him. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the opportunity to be together with fellow believers. Thank you for every person who's come out this morning and those who will uh, tune in online. And we pray that uh, the Word of God will speak to us. We need you, Lord. We need you so desperately in our world, in our nation. We need you in our lives to lead us and guide us day by day. We thank you for all that you do for us. We're abundantly blessed. As the psalmist David said, the lines have fallen to us in pleasant places. And we thank you for your goodness and mercy. We pray for those who are suffering today, those who are part of this congregation who are sick and in need of prayer, and we lift them up to you. And we thank you that you're the great physician, and by your stripes we are healed. Now we pray that you will open our minds, that we will hear and receive your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Well, if you have your Bible, if you'll turn with me to the book of Romans, Romans chapter 12. The Apostle Paul is the writer, and he's right into the church at Rome. And we want to look at the first two verses in Romans chapter 12 this morning. As Paul writes to believers there in Rome, he says, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. Amen. This is the word of God. And Isaiah, in his writing, said that the Grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our God will stand forever. So we love God's word today, and we thank him for giving us his word to guide us and lead us. Paul in these two scriptures is really focusing in on living a holy life. And to live a holy life, to live a life of righteousness and do what is right, it is not something that we can do in our own power, in our own strength, in our own ability. It takes the grace of God to live a holy life. And it takes the power of the Holy Spirit to enable us to live a life that is pleasing to God. And that's our desire as believers. We want to please the Lord. We want the Lord to be pleased with our lives, with what we do. and. So Paul is calling these Christians to holy living. He's calling these believers, he, he addresses them as brothers. He said, I appeal to you therefore brothers. And though Paul is a great theologian, a great man of God, he's writing to young believers and he calls them brothers in the Lord. And he, admonish, he is admonishing them to live holy and pure lives before God. Now, the first 11 chapters of Romans, Paul is talking to us about how to be saved. He's, he's telling us what salvation really means. He's telling us what we are saved from. And he's telling us what salvation has done for us. In fact, in chapter 1, he says the wrath of God has been poured out on sinful men. He gives them over, the Lord has given them over to a reprobate man. And then in chapter 3 he says, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. In chapter 5 he says, therefore being justified by faith we have peace with God 
through our Lord Jesus Christ. And then in chapter six, he says, what shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? And then he says, God forbid. Chapter seven, he deals with what we all deal with in our lives. He said, every time I desire to do good, evil is present. The good that I would do, I find myself not doing. The evil that I do not want to do is what I do. And then he said, oh, wretched man that I am, who can deliver us from this body of death? In chapter eight, he says, there's therefore now no condemnation to them that are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. And also in that chapter in verse 28, he says, for we know that for those who love the Lord, all things work together for good, for those who are called according to his purpose. And then when you get to chapter 10, he really focuses in on salvation. In uh, chapter 10, Romans 10 and 9, a favorite verse of mine, the little poem goes so we can remember it. And it says, if you believe in your heart and confess with your mouth that God raised Jesus from the dead, you shall be saved. So Paul is dealing with theological truths. He's dealing with doctrine. And in the first 11 chapters of Romans, Paul gives us a great deal of doctrine, important truths about what salvation does for us, how we can come to the Lord and be saved and receive the gift of eternal life. He goes on in chapter 10 when he says, if we believe in our heart and confess with our mouth that God raised Jesus from the dead, we'll be saved. Then he says, but how are they to call on him in whom they have not believed? And how are, they believe, how are they to believe on him whom they've not heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? And how are they to preach unless they're sent? For it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. So in those first 11 chapters, Paul deals with what God has done for us in redemption. They're wonderful chapters, and they remind us of salvation, of the price that Jesus paid on the cross, dying in our place for our sins, taking the punishment for our sins. And then when he comes to chapter 12, there is a different focus. You see, Paul is a writer, not only here in Romans, but in other epistles that he wrote. He's a man who deals with doctrine, with theology, but he never leaves us just with a knowledge of doctrine. He always adds to that what that means to us and how we're to live out our faith in this world. So in the remaining chapters, chapter 12 through 16, he deals with what we ought to do in response to having been saved in the first place. Salvation is great. Being born again is great. It's a gift from Almighty God. We don't merit it. We don't earn it. We don't deserve it. We can't do enough good deeds to deserve salvation. And our good deeds doesn't cause us to be saved. It's a gift from God. But after we're born again, there's a lifestyle that we should live out in our service to the Lord. And so Paul begins to talk about practical matters. Because the Lord has done so much for us, then how are we to show our appreciation for what he has done? And we show that appreciation by living lives that are pleasing to him. He changes his focus and he begins to deal with practical matters in our life. He deals with everyday aspects in the believer's life. You see, uh, I'm on my way to heaven, and I assume you are on your way to heaven, right? I assume you're on your way to heaven, right? <laughs> right. We're on our way to heaven. We stopped by Sardis Baptist Church this morning, but we are on our way to heaven. But I'm on my way to heaven, but I have to live in this world. How many of you know this world is not heaven? It is not heaven. We're going to a better place. But I'm on my way to heaven, but I have to live in this world. Not in the sweet by and by, but in the nasty here and now. I live in this world. I'm a citizen of heaven, 
and I live in a foreign land. I live on foreign soil. soil. The songwriter said it this way. He said, this world is not my home. I'm just a passing through. You folk are old enough to remember that song, right? <laughs> we don't sing it anymore, but uh, the, the old timers used to sing, this world is not my home. I'm just passing through. My treasures are laid up somewhere beyond the blue, and I'll stop there, and I won't try to sing it. But we are passing through this world. Jesus, in his high priestly prayer, he prayed this way. He said, Lord, don't take them out of the world, but take the world out of them. We are to be in the world, but not of the world. And that's the tension of living out our lives. When Paul writes to these believers in Rome, Rome was not a righteous place. Rome was not filled with many, many Christians. In fact, there was a lot of ungodliness in Rome, just like there are a lot of ungodliness in our day. And Paul isn't saying to them, leave Rome. Go somewhere where you're surrounded by better surroundings. And Christianity isn't lived out in solitude. Christianity isn't to be lived out in a mountain away from everybody else, just waiting for the Lord. We are to live out our lives in the world in which we live and make a difference in this world. So Paul isn't telling them to leave, but he is going to give them some advice, some godly advice. Paul is giving us some good advice. He, he's given good godly counsel. How many of you know that we need good godly counsel? We need advice. And Paul is giving not only the believers in that day, but he's given us godly advice as to how we ought to live. So that's what he's doing. And let's reread verse 1 and look at it. He said, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your spiritual worship. Uh, I think the King James says reasonable service, spiritual worship. So Paul is given advice here. And he is saying the way we live out our lives in ungodly environment is to totally yield to God, yield ourselves to God. In fact, he said, uh, present your body as a living sacrifice. He's uh, going back to the Old Testament and <coughs> reminded them of the animal sacrifices that they brought and put on the altar. But now he's saying in this New Testament day, we don't bring animals to the altar, but we bring ourselves to the altar. And we present ourselves as a living sacrifice unto him. And he goes on to say that when we do that, we are really engaging in spiritual worship, worship of the Lord. Nothing says, I love you to the Lord, like a consecrated, dedicated, holy life. When we live a life that is pleasing to Him, that is worship. We gather together for corporate worship on Sunday morning, and we have a great uh, praise leader in Tim, and he leads us corporately into the presence of Almighty God. But that shouldn't be the only time that we worship. In fact, as believers, that is not the only time that we worship. When we give ourselves to the Lord, when we surrender ourselves to the Lord, that is an act of worship. And it is a daily thing that we do. Getting up in the morning and surrendering our lives to the Lord. Getting up in the morning and giving ourselves to the Lord. And living out our lives as individuals who are totally surrendered to the Lord. So that's what he's calling them to do. He said, I appeal, I urge you, I admonish you, brothers, by the mercies of God, present your bodies as a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God, which is your spiritual service. He said, I appeal to you, therefore. And he really is going all the way back through those first 11 chapters. And he's really saying, because of all that God has done for you, then you ought to respond to him by surrendering yourself totally to him and responding to him in worship. He's saying, therefore, since the Lord has saved me, 
Therefore, since the Lord has bought me with a price, therefore, since the Lord laid down his life for me, therefore, since the Lord shed his blood for me, therefore, since the Lord came from heaven all the way to the earth and died on the cross as a ransom for my sins, therefore, I ought to submit myself to him and in surrendered myself to him, I am truly worshiping him. God has been good to us. God has been good to us. His mercies are new every morning. God has been good to us in sending his son Jesus to die on the cross for our sins. And what Paul is saying is this, God has been good to you and in response to that, you ought to come to him in worship. You ought to come to him in surrendering your life totally to him. When we do that, we are really saying, God, you own me. If we call ourselves Christians, then we are bond servants to the Lord. We are slaves to him. A living sacrifice, by that Paul is saying, we are dead to the things of the world. We are dead to our desires. We are dead to the things around us, and we are alive unto the Lord. We present our bodies, and I think he uses that term body because he's really talking about the hold of us, who we are. We give our total self, we present our body, and when we present ourselves to the Lord, we are saying, Lord, I am placing myself at your disposal. I'm at your disposal. I am not in control. Have your way in my life. What Paul is saying is because of all that Christ has done for us, we need to give ourselves to him and say, Lord, if you can use me in any way, use me. I'm available for your service. I have surrendered myself to you. We give ourselves to the Lord, and when we do, we can't say, Lord, save me, but don't rule my life. Don't tell me what to do. You know, growing up, most people, young people don't like to be told what to do. We rebel against that. And sometimes husbands don't like their wives to tell them what to do. And sometimes wives don't like their husbands to tell them what to do. Sometimes my wife will tell me something to do, and I, I have this little say, and I say, you're not in charge of me. <laughs> you're not in charge of me. But then she has some sayings, too, <laughs> and I won't share those. But uh, it's not a natural thing to want somebody else to be in charge of you. We talk, especially as Americans, we talk about self-made men men who make it on their own, no one to guide them or direct them. But as believers, we have to come to the place where we say, Lord, I accept what you have done for me. I believe you're the Christ, the Son of the living God, and I want you to save me, and you can rule in my life. You can't come to the Lord for salvation and say, Lord, save me, but this is a part of my life I want you to leave alone. It doesn't work that way. Take me to heaven, but don't have anything to do with my life down here. Let me live like I want to live down here. Anyone who owns you has the right to tell you what to do. And so the Lord is in charge of us. It is not something that comes easy to us, but it is a surrendering process. There's an old song in the church, I surrender, I surrender all. And a lot of serving God is learning to surrender our lives to Him. Learning that it's not about us, it's about Him. And surrender our lives to Him. And we can walk away from that and not allow Him full reign in our lives. But He's been so good to us, we don't want to do that. We want to serve Him. I'm 73 years of age, and I've been serving the Lord for a long time and walking with Him. And I want to continue to walk with Him because it's a marathon. And He's been so good to me in my life, I want to see what the end is going to be like. I'm in it for the long haul. 
I don't want to walk away. I want to serve him all the days of my life and finish well. And a lot of us here this morning are not as far as we once were from the finish line. And we all want to finish well. We want to continue to surrender our lives to him. I started out by saying it's a challenge to live a holy life. You can't do it on your own. It takes surrender. We need God's spirit. So Paul is admonishing, advising the believers at Rome. He said, I appeal to you, brethren, by the mercies of God, because of all that God has done for you, present yourself as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto him, which is your spiritual worship. Then in verse two, he gives us some added advice. He says, do not be conformed to this world but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you might test, that by testing you might discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. Not only does he talk to us about worship, but he's given us some wisdom here when he says, don't conform to the world. J.B. Phillips translation, I like the way he puts it, it says, do not let the world squeeze you into its mold because you are not of the world. You live in the world, but you're not of the world. As believers, we're to have a Christian world view. And our Christian world view tells us that all unrighteousness is sin and the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Unrighteousness, all unrighteousness is sin. The wages of sin is death. We live in a world where sin is not spoken of freely in the marketplace and where many things are accepted and few are against anything that's happening in our society. But we cannot be conformed to the world and accept what the world says is truth. When he talks about the world, he's talking about the age in which he lived. And we can address it to the age in which we live, the time, times in which we live. And in the times in which we live, there are many things that the world says is truth and is okay. But as believers, We do not conform to that. We conform to what the Word says. The Word is truth. The Word is the guide by which we are to live as believers. So we have to stop accepting what the world says is truth and accept what the Word says is truth and live by the Word. We live in America and as we have Uh, read the history of our nation. Its founding was on many Christian principles, but our nation has drifted far away from what it was in generations past. And many things that society reinforced that were Christian ideals, society doesn't reinforce today. And because of that, we as believers will stand out more today than we did in generations past. If we live our lives according to the precepts and the word of Almighty God. So we have to guard against conformity. We have to guard against trying to be accepted by the world. The Bible really tells us that the world ought to be influenced by the church. But in our day, there's much reversal. And many times the church is influenced by the attitudes of the world by the beliefs of the world. And I believe as we near the return of Christ, that difference will become broader and the church will be an entity that sticks out in society more than ever before. And Paul has given us good advice here when he says, wisdom is to stick with the principles of the word of God. Now I know things change in a society Uh, Dress codes have changed in my lifetime. Um, We used to wear neckties when we went to church, dress up. Now we don't. We just are casual. That doesn't mean that 
the church has backslidden because we don't wear neckties. I'm not sure if they were from God in the first place. <laughs> but, but, so I'm not talking about that kind of thing. Things like that can change in a society, but there are truths in God's Word. The killing of innocent lives through abortion is not what should be done in a society. Living immoral lives is not what should be lived out in a society. These things are true, and they stay true regardless of what society says. So Paul says, he gives us some wisdom, don't conform to the world. Don't change your beliefs because the majority change their beliefs. Steadfast, stay steadfast to the word of Almighty God. Well, he goes on in this verse and he says, don't be conformed to the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Transformation, be transformed, be changed. It's uh, similar to the word used when Jesus was transfigured on the mountain before the disciples and his Deity was seen more than his humanity. And Paul says, don't conform to the world, but be transformed. Let Jesus be seen in you. Like the little boy that asked his dad, he said, how big is God? And the father said, well, he's big, son. And the son said, well, he's big as you, dad. He said, oh, yeah, he's as big as I am. Is he as big as a house? Oh, yeah, he's as big as a house. He said, I don't understand it. Sunday school, Sunday school teacher said, Jesus lives in my heart. If he's that big and he lives in my heart, it looks like he'd stick out. And the truth is, if we are not conforming to the world, but allowing God to transform us, he sticks out. He should stick out in our lives. We are transformed. And he says this transformation takes place by the renewing of our mind. How do we renew our mind. Well, we're not supposed to think like and live like society says we should. We are to think like and live like the Bible says we ought to live. So the way that my mind is transformed is by the word of Almighty God. The Bible says, Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. So to live a life that's pleasing to God we have to be men and women who continually put the Word of God into our hearts. Jesus said it this way in John chapter 8. He said, if you continue in my Word, then you're my disciples indeed. You'll know the truth, and the truth will set you free. What I want you to see in that verse is Jesus said, if you continue in my Word, not just a one time, receiving of God's Word, but a daily dose of God's Word. If you continue studying my Word, if you continue reading my Word, if you continue listening to my Word, you'll be my disciples indeed. You'll truly be my disciples, and you'll know the truth, and the truth will set you free. There was a, a motivational speaker. His name was Zig Ziglar. I don't know, he wrote books and made motivational speeches and he had this little saying, he says, sometimes we need a checkup from the neck up so that we don't have stinking thinking. <laughs> and he was uh, a believer, he was a part of a Baptist church. But I, I thought about that little saying when I was preparing these remarks. We need to check up what our mind is meditating on check up what our mind is thinking on, and make sure we're thinking on those things that are pleasing to God. Whatever things are lovely, of a good report. Paul says, if be any virtue, be any praise, think on these things. Meditate on these things. The Bible says that, in fact, here in the 10th chapter of Romans, the Bible says, faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. To live this life that pleases God that Paul says we ought to live because of all that God has done for us. We can't do it without feeding on the word of Almighty God. We have to stay in the word. Pastor Ken is always admonishing us to stay in the word. 
when we were going through COVID and we were shut in, you remember he told us we should uh, give 20 minutes a day to reading the word. And I think he had it timed out how long it'd take to read the New Testament, but he's always encouraging us to read the word of God. He's a good preacher. He's a good Bible teacher. But just coming to Sunday school and coming to Sunday morning worship is not enough. We need the Word of God. We need to be students of the Word of Almighty God. In fact, right now, during this month of July, there's a challenge that he's put before us to read every day the 13th chapter of 1 Corinthians. I won't ask you to raise your hand if you've been faithful to that, but there's a purpose behind why he does that. We want to be believers. We want to be believers indeed. We want to know the truth. We want to live godly lives. And in order to do that, we can't go on yesterday's blessing or yesterday's manna that came in to Israel just on a daily basis. On a daily basis, we have to go to God's Word and let God speak to us and let our mind be renewed to the Word of Almighty God. We have in our day so many ways that we take in information through our cell phone, through our iPad, through the radio, through the television. Some of us may even still read books, uh, literally. But, but we have so much information bombarding us. And if we don't block out some space and say, Lord, I want to come to you and surrender myself to you afresh and anew. I want to hear you speak to me through your word then we can't live the life that God delights in us living before Him. But with God's help, we can be victorious. We can live this life with God's help if we will take Paul's wisdom. So Paul gives us this godly advice. He says, first of all, because of all that God has done for us, be worshipers by presenting yourself, surrendering yourself to Him. And then He gives us some wisdom. He says, don't conform to the world, but let the Word of God transform you into the kind of believer and the kind of person filled with the love that Paul talks about in 13th chapter of Corinthians. Being the believer that God would have you to be. And then He closes by saying, if all of that happens in your life, then you will be able to discern what is the will of God, what is good, acceptable, and perfect. Sometimes we want to know, well, all the time we're wanting to know what's God's will for my life. And sometimes I think we want God to paint a picture and tell us what the future holds. But it usually doesn't work that way. But if we will worship Him by surrendering our will to Him, if we will not conform to the world, but be transformed by the renewing of our mind, then day by day, we will understand what the perfect will of Almighty God is. God's will is for you and I to live lives that are pleasing to Him. We can't do it on our own. We can't do it in our own strength. But greater is He that's in me than he that is in the world. And with that inner strength of the Holy Spirit, we can live lives that are pleasing to Him, and those lives that please Him will be of benefit to other people. When we are in God's Word, meditating on His Word, being renewed by His Word, God is transforming us into the kind of believer who can live not separate from the world, but in the world, but make a difference because the Lord sticks out of us and we're able to share the good news of Jesus. We live in a world that desperately needs the Lord. We have neighbors and family and friends who desperately need the Lord. That's why we ought to be believers, continue in His Word, be His disciple indeed, know the truth, and be able to share the good news of Christ. God bless all of you for being here. Um, and God bless you for staying awake. I didn't see anybody sleeping. If you did, you did it with your eyes open. <laughs> but I'm glad you came out. It's a good thing to come during the week, isn't it? And be with other believers and be renewed in our faith. And 
be recharged to go out and continue to serve God and do what he'd have us to do. Let's close in prayer. Father, we thank you for your word today. Lord, we love your word. We thank you that your word leads us, guides us, and directs us. And you haven't left us without the aid of the Holy Spirit and the word of God. We get knowledge from your word. We get boldness from your spirit to be the kind of believer that you would have us to be. We thank you again for each person that is here. And Father, may we reaffirm our faith in you today by surrendering our will totally to you. And may we not conform to the things that are happening round about us, but may we be renewed day by day by staying in your word. And then Lord, as we do that, we thank you that we will be able to live out the will of God in our lives. We ask all of this in the name that's above every name, the name of Jesus, our wonderful Lord. Amen.